let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, we, we're uh, very glad that all of you joined us here today. We have an exciting topic. Uh, we call this a collaboratory because it means that we'll be working together. Everybody here on, the, on this Zoom uh, should participate. And there are several ways to do that, which I'll tell you about in a second. But uh, today's topic is all about the effect of the coronavirus COVID-19 on uh, the global supply chain for food. And we've got some great speakers here and great attendees. And one thing we've learned from doing this, this is our fifth one we've done on this COVID-19 issue and how it affects supply chains, is we've learned that it takes, it takes a lot of participation to make this work. And our first, our first uh, four calls, we had that tremendously. For a lot of people participating, offering opinions, ideas, asking questions, and it just made for a very robust discussion. So I encourage everybody who joins to uh, please uh, speak up and be, be involved. You know, my name is George Bailey. I run the Digital Supply Chain Institute uh, Research Group. Um, uh, very excited about the discussion today. We're gonna have a, a great conversation. Um, and the way it works is, those of you on the phone, right, on the Zoom right now, you have uh, a couple ways to participate. The, the, the easiest way is to um, enter the Q&A set, Q&A button, click on it, and then write your question or comment. And that way everyone will see it. We'll be able to respond to it right away and get back to you. Uh, it, we've had a couple of calls where we've had to come back to those things later on and answer them in an after the meeting format, but we will answer all the questions. We will get back to you with uh, whatever discussion topics are of interest. Uh, the other way is to, uh, um, uh, We'll, we'll recognize some of you and you'll be able to speak out. You can ask, to, ask that through chat and we'll be able to get your conversations going immediately. So uh, please, everybody, let's, let's make sure we participate and be involved. Uh, so the Digital Supply Chain Institute is a not-for-profit that focuses on the future of supply chains across industries, but this food industry is probably one of the most interesting ones right now. And so we have three objectives for this collaboratory. Uh, the first one, is we want to make sure that we can outline the overall impact of the coronavirus on global supply chains in the food industry uh, and what we can expect to see next. Uh, second objective is to really describe what actions are being taken right now, very practical things that uh, are being done to make uh, life better for companies and for customers. Uh, and some very, very specific examples. And what you'll find out is that uh, a lot of the things that are being done in this industry are applicable to other industries. So even if you're not in the food industry, what you're going to hear about and what we're going to talk about should be useful to you. And the third objective is to develop some recommendations that will help you know, your supply chain with your customers and your shareholders so that you can go back and, uh, and, and add even more value with your company as you, uh, as you return to work uh, after this call. So three things, outline, describe, and develop. Uh, next slide, please. And here's our agenda to do that. Uh, I'm going through a very quick introduction right now. Um, I'm going to just take a few minutes and I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Mark, who is the SVP at uh, the uh, FMI, uh, the Food Industry Association. He's got great perspectives on what's happening and the good, good ideas about uh, some of the trends and what, what, what uh, he and his organization is working on and also what companies are dealing with. And then we have, uh, uh, from, we have Chris Lewis from Mahold Del Hayes, and that's a really powerful company with some great examples of really decisive actions that are being taken to meet customer needs and uh, improve, improve the business. So we'll, we'll go through all that. And our goal is to get all of that done by 9.35 in the morning. Uh, uh, when we do that, we'll have plenty of time for discussion, uh, Q&A. Uh, I'll come back at the end and wrap it up with some observations and a summary. And we'll respect your time, make sure that we're done by 10 a.m. Eastern time uh, today. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, Quick background. Obviously, companies are very much focused on the present. Just getting through this COVID-19 coronavirus thing is not easy, but they're also preparing for the future. Um, it's been amazing to see the remarkable growth in many food-related companies, not all of them, but you've really seen a consumer spending shift from restaurants to grocery stores. So that's a, re a really major shift there. Um, we've had big growth in go-direct models, uh, Peapod, very successful Whole Foods direct model. Uh, so much more go direct than we've seen before in the past in, in terms of the food industry. Uh, however, there is still a lot of uncertainty about what the long-term impact will be. Uh, will consumers 
can still have historically high grocery spend numbers. Is that a shift that's happening now? We're gonna see that continue. Uh, will we experience more shortages? You know, we've had a bunch of them. The first one, of course, was toilet paper. Uh, then it was flour. Now people are talking about protein and meat. So uh, you'll hear about that today. But, you know, will we experience shortages and how those be handled through the supply chain? And uh, of course, longer term, will consumers still buy from home uh, as they are doing more and more right now? And uh, the final thing I would say is never waste a good crisis. Uh, companies are really taking action now to prepare supply chains for the future. And the food industry has a great set of uh, companies that are really winning and uh, making great progress. You're going to hear from one of those today. And also companies that have had some adjustments to do because, for example, Cisco with less, less restaurant business. Uh, so a lot of things happening uh, that, are, that are very, very fundamental to the business. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we've done a lot of survey work on this. You can get more of this as we go through. This is a survey of almost 5,000 people. We asked them questions like, do you prefer local produce? Uh, uh, more than ever. A third said, basically a third said yes, and I'll even pay more. A third said no. Uh, I'd like to, I'd like to take those local products, but I wouldn't pay more for them. And then another third said no preference. So it's, it's interesting how the market is developing and how you bet on this is very, very important <clears throat> as you adjust your supply chain. So getting things done quickly uh, th uh, through transformational change in the supply chain and being able to meet needs like this are, are critical. Next slide, please. Um, so what, what's happened uh, for local food products? Uh, over half say it's increased. Um, and, uh, and that's really the big news that more and more people are focusing more on direct food products that are, are, are locally based. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, that's my quick set of comments to get us kicked off. Uh, really looking forward to a great discussion. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Mark, who's the uh, SVP from uh, FMI. So. Mark, would you take it over, please? Absolutely. Thank you, George, so much for the introduction. Uh, I might say, before we even get started, parenthetically, um, some of the trends that you outlined in your survey work were actually occurring pre-COVID-19 um, and have accelerated exponentially in the context of what's happening now. And I'm sure we'll address quite a bit uh, along those lines as we get into the Q&A, particularly in the shifts between food service and retail and the winners and the losers and the partnerships that are occurring as a result of all this. But let me just, if I can, if you go to the next slide, please uh, spend a minute on who we are. So we are FMI, uh, the Food Industry Association. Uh, we have three sort of core competencies within our mission. One is to be advocates uh, for public policy. At the federal level, we interface with lawmakers and regulators and the executive branch. Um, at the state level, particularly in the context of this pandemic with the governor's role in um, managing through this crisis and, and state's departments of health as well, as well as local municipalities. Um, the, uh, the central core pillar uh, uh, of FMI, I like to say job one is food and product safety because it's after all where life and death matters are at stake. Uh, so we interface with a number of the government agencies, FDA, USDA, CDC, among them. Uh, we also own a food safety certification uh, business called Safe Quality Food Institute. We actually certify manufacturing facilities to ensure that they aren't just in compliance with FDA rates, but they meet our standards, which we uh, think are higher as well. The third pillar is really around trading partner collaboration, and that's between retailers and product suppliers. So uh, we're a member-based organization, our members are retailers and wholesalers and consumer goods and other related product suppliers. Uh, within that context, we focus on three things, really to enhance efficiency in any way possible. You know, as we like to say, retail and grocery is a penny business. It's a razor thin margin that our members operate on. And Chris will attest to that when he speaks in just a little bit. So anything we can do to stay relentlessly focused on enhancing efficiency through supply chain, through information technology, through uh, retail and store operations and the like is very much within our bailiwick. And then on the other side, anything we can do to increase demand. So we spend a lot of time on issues like marketing and merchandising and category management and assortment and consumer trends to better understand them so that we can optimize not just the mix in store, but the consumer experience as well. And the consumer experience is changing, which really kind of leads me to the third thing, which is really the digitally 
engaged food shopper. There's been a massive shift to online in recent years. Uh, and that's really led to what we call sort of the omni consumer or the omni channel approach to the business. And we'll talk more about that when we get into this because that's also accelerated in the context of COVID-19. Uh, next slide, please. So when I think about the food industry supply chain priorities, these priorities actually existed pre-COVID-19. Um, when we were looking at you know, uh, emerging technologies and their impact on the business and the interface between our physical distribution and, and, and historical store level jobs and how the application of technology might impact them and how we would make the best use of that. However, in the context of COVID-19, the, these intense demand spikes, uh, the need to expand the supply chain. And I have to say, uh, and we'll talk more about this in the q and I've been absolutely inspired by supply chain resilience within the food industry, its ability to expand um, and to deliver what consumers need through a very, very, very unprecedented time, at least within our lifetime. We'll talk a little bit about demand and shortages and categories and replenishment all the way to the shelf in a bit as well. But Needless to say, what a lot of our members are focused on now are touchless transactions and frictionless shopping. The number of applications that are now in the marketplace are expanding significantly. Everything from some would call one touch, still a transaction at the register, to absolute seamless um, transactions for consumers. There's more mobile scanning being done by customers. Um, obviously, there are rules of engagement there. Customers who are going to use mobile scanning devices are going to have to submit themselves to potentially random audits, much like we do if any of you are clear users at airports going through TSA. Um, and there are more and more pilots being put up across the country. And the other thing that retailers are realizing through all this is that in addition to the customer benefits, there are a lot of front end labor benefits in addition to that as well. Very similar to what we have found in self checkout in recent years as we've given over more uh, checkout lanes to, to self checkout. Uh, next slide, please. So throughout, we do a lot of research over the course of the year. Uh, we have two significant signature pieces of research. One is consumer based called Grocery Trends. The other is called FMI Speaks, which really puts its finger on the pulse of what's keeping retailers up at night and their outlook for the business. But throughout this pandemic, starting in early March, we in partnership with the Hartman Group added a series of grocery shopper trends to augment our regular research. And this is just one sort of uh, small piece from the most recent. So from early March all the way through today, we've been sort of taking the temperature of customers, I mean that figuratively, of course, about how they are responding to this pandemic. And it's interesting now, several months in, you can see from this particular slide, uh, there is still some concern about out of stocks. And uh, originally, you know, we talk about in, in, in the food industry, uh, those peak times over the course of the year. We experience shortages when there are snow days, for example. Um, and we experience sometimes shortages around peak holiday days. And I had one retailer CEO describe this to me as 10 snow days, Christmas and Thanksgiving all rolled into one day after day after day. Um, and you know from your own experiences what it's been like in terms of your own households and whether you're really stocking up or stockpiling in some cases, what those key categories are. But I think it's really kind of safe to say that by and large, the supply chain, and Chris will talk specifically to the Ahold Del Hayes USA and their banners experiences, uh, has been remarkable in its ability to expand rationalize assortments in many cases or skews so they could expand capacity on those most in-demand items. And yes, there were some chronic shortages in categories in paper goods and sanitizers and cleaners, uh, again, due to the psychology of consumers in their shopping trips during that period of time. But by and large, if you did not find something on the shelf that you were looking for, if you come back tomorrow, it would likely be there. Tomorrow or the next day, it may not be your favorite brand, so we've seen a lot of brand switching and a lot of trial on brands that consumers wouldn't necessarily buy. But th th generally speaking, our ability to replenish at the shelf has been somewhat remarkable. Uh, just a bit more on, on the pulse of shopper behavior. If you go to the next slide, please. What's really interesting to me, and I won't read the slide to you, but this is really you know, what we have to better understand as we go through the back end of this. 
And that is the shifts in shopper behavior. So, you know, virtually 90% of all shoppers have made changes in how they shop. And the changes range from who shops, who was primary, who's primary today, where they shop. Lots of shifts through primary banners and other things, less cherry picking of more formats more frequently, given less frequent shops. How they shop, their frequency is down. What they buy has shifted. There's been a resurgence of center store categories. If you look at some of those large cap traditional categories, a lot of consumers have hunkered down and they're seeking comfort and nostalgia through a very, very difficult time. And a lot of those center store category product suppliers have seen upticks in their business. So what they buy has changed. How much time they spend shopping has changed. Nobody's sort of lingering and browsing and sort of moving up and down aisles at a leisurely pace. So they're getting in and they're getting out. But one of the things that's really interesting about that is they're spending more. So part of that is stock up. Um, and part of that has to do with the shift in the way that they are shopping both physically and online. So we've seen this tremendous shift to online uh, over this period of time, particularly in cohorts that had never shopped online before, either because they didn't have the, the time or the, or the energy or they were um, uh, confronted by other limitations. For the first time they went online and they found out that in some cases, it's a pretty easy experience to navigate. Um, it's pretty convenient. And although some had some issues with delivery windows and surcharges in some cases, depending on, Chris will address this, by and large, that shift is, um, is here to stay. And we've been on a five-year journey with the digitally engaged food shopper. Originally, we thought it would shift to about $100 billion by 2025. In the last two years, we've revised that projection uh, three times. And by the way, the last time was to about 140 or 150 billion by 2025, and that was pre-COVID. So you can imagine we're gonna be doing more work along those lines as well. Just a couple more minutes um, on FMI and what we're doing in the context of all of this. If you go to the next slide, please. So I talked about our work with, with um, public policy before. In the context of COVID-19, we have been interfacing daily um, with Congress, with the agencies, uh, both at the federal and state level, uh, in order to provide input as to what our members need as essential industries throughout this time. And I mean that up and downstream, both manufacturers, plants and facilities, uh, trucks over the road, distribution center and store operations. Also trying to provide guidance to our members on probably job one, which is uh, personal protection at store level for our employees. That is absolutely our number one criteria. Uh, frankly, the grocery workers in store and those behind the scenes, uh, stocking shelves in distribution centers, delivering from manufacturing facilities or producing those products have been the frontline heroes and all that. And we take that very, very seriously. So we've been doing our best to provide guidance to them and we've stood up a number of resources through all of this. And you can see on the page here, uh, we've We've developed a number of best practices and frameworks and methodologies. We've provided a number of guidance documents. I've talked a little bit about the, uh, the shopper trends and understanding consumer trends, a lot of um, safety resources as well, uh, and a number of other business resources. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, uh, George, you referenced Cisco early on in this, and the CEO of Cisco at a White House task force meeting mentioned the fact that due to the significant drop off, particularly their commercial food service business up and down the street operators, that they had significant capacity, uh, both in products as well as services, uh, trucks, warehousing facilities and the like, at a time when our retail members had just a tremendous need, an accelerated need for all of those things. So originally, we entered into an agreement with the food service distributors. And what we did was we matched our retailers' requirements. We, we quickly developed a fillable form that made it very simple to put down your product requirements and or your service requirements, which we shared in our counterparts with the food service distributors. They would then match that in local marketplaces with the broadline food service distributors based on product needs, availability, as well as geography. But we realized, although we put this up quickly and it was working, it was clunky, it was manual, and we were in the middle. 
we needed to expand that. So what we did, if you'll go to the next slide, is we, in very short order, put up a new food industry trading exchange. And now, in a very, very automated fashion, we now can, on the buy side, have category managers and others looking for product, do procurement searches, and do product discovery. And then on the sell side, those with capacity can do everything from buy now offers to load up and let retailers seek them out. Um, we, are, we are putting this up year round. So the, the idea here was to get this into the marketplace given the extraordinary requirements of the time, but to run it during blue sky days. So as buyers and sellers better understand this platform and it gets to scale, when we have another crisis, and it's not limited to the COVID-19 pandemic, we're getting into hurricane season. As you know, there's one brewing right off of Mexico right now and moving up towards the Gulf. That is when we need to turn up the volume and make sure that these things happen in a very, very quick fashion. So we're really pleased with this. I'm gonna mention just one more thing if you go to the next slide. Another sort of unique circumstance uh, given this pandemic, and that is, our workforce requirements expanded exponentially. All of a sudden, we literally had to hire, and you saw the numbers, large publicly traded companies, Amazon, Walmart, Target, Instacart, and others, into the hundreds of thousands, into the millions of job requirements, while at the same time, there were millions of, of workers being furloughed and laid off on the other side, in the food service business, at restaurants, and distributors, um, in the airlines, in hotels, <coughs> excuse me, in hospitality providers, we now have three quarters of them. So we put up a talent exchange with Eightfold AI. They are an, an artificial intelligence-based talent platform. And you can see some of the companies that are participating in this. And we put up this platform in, at clock speed. And we now have over three quarters of a million job openings on the demand side of this exchange. And it is our goal to make a million matches over time. And once that occurs, we are gonna leave this up year round. We believe that this is part of the future of talent within our industry, mixing and matching needs and resources accordingly. So with that, if you'll go to the next slide, I, I wanna thank you all very much. Looking forward to the Q&A and the discussion. I'd now like to turn it over to my colleague, Chris Lewis, who's Executive Vice President of Supply Chain at Ajo Del Hayes USA. Take it away, Chris. Thanks, Mark. If you could flip that slide for me. Just uh, quickly, a couple of words maybe about uh, Ajo Belize. Uh, we have five brands operating on the East Coast. Uh, and like many others on the supply chain, always, uh, as Mark mentioned, trying to optimize and innovate to uh, you know, meet our customers' needs, and whether that's in-store or online. Uh, if you could flip that slide for me. On the East Coast, you know, we have 2,000 stores from Maine to uh, the Carolinas. Uh, we're just north of 40 billion in sales on an annual basis. Uh, and we have somewhere around 16 distribution centers, uh, a couple of uh, manufacturing facilities to support those stores. Uh, and we manage right around or handle about a billion cases a year. Uh, and on the East Coast, uh, we have about 150 million miles we run on our trucks every year. Uh, so it's a fairly dense, uh, and a uh, fairly large uh, supply chain uh, on the East Coast. You could flip that slide for me. What I thought I would do is just share uh, some of our experiences, uh, you know, as we went through COVID. Uh, and internally, when I do updates for the executive team, uh, or any team for that matter, we, we talk about it in three buckets. Uh, first, on the people side, uh, as Mark mentioned, uh, we had a lot of opportunities uh, from a hiring standpoint. We did uh, partner with uh, many food service organizations and brought folks in from U.S. Foods, uh, Cisco Performance Food Group, uh, and several others. Uh, we had uh, certainly Capstone, FHI, and others that were supplying us labor. Uh, and we had a great response from, from those partners. Uh, for me, one of the things that was always important is we needed our associates to uh, be safe coming to work, but they needed to feel safe too. And so we did a lot, uh, like many others, around uh, sanitation and cleaning, uh, different protocols like that. Uh, we built uh, a lot of programs from a social distancing standpoint. As you know, working in a DC, you have uh, fixed walls. And when you have that many more people working in buildings, 
Uh, there's a lot to do around uh, simple things like, you know, starts of shifts. And so staggering shifts, staggering breaks, uh, try to get creative uh, in the south where it's warm, put picnic tables outside. We try to feed our associates uh, on a regular basis uh, so that uh, one, it was a little bit of an ad for them, uh, but we could also control and close our cafeterias. Uh, and that way we kept from a sanitation standpoint, it was easier to manage the, uh, both the flow of people and, and their breaks. Uh, we incented early with our associates that we paid them if they worked uh, a perfect attendance for a week. And so if they showed up for all of their scheduled shifts, uh, we gave them a bonus in their next week's paycheck. So we tried to make it very immediate. We tried to make it very real for them. The other thing that we gave incentives for is uh, with that you know, crazy demand we all experienced, uh, we needed more people and more labor hours. And so we, we paid them bonuses for coming in on their day off and doing shifts. Uh, and we had a remarkable amount, remarkable amount of people that actually took us up on that. So they worked on their days off to uh, help us catch up. Uh, and one thing that we're proud of is on average, we had about a 90% attendance rate uh, at our facilities. Uh, we had uh, in some weeks and some DCs uh, more than 80% perfect attendance. So with all the pressure and all the news uh, and all the things that our associates were going through, uh, they kept coming to work. A part of that was all the activities we're talking about, but we used uh, alert media to push messages and communicate with them when they're not in the building. Uh, we had one instance that uh, somebody put on Facebook, we had an issue in one of our facilities, which we didn't. And the next day we had a high call out. And so we deployed quickly, uh, trying to reach out to them every single day that would say, here's what the workload looks like. Uh, here's if there's any news from a COVID standpoint in that specific facility from somebody they know they were hearing this from. Uh, and then what's for lunch? Uh, and so we were trying to keep uh, a positive uh, connection with our teams as uh, we were dependent on them to serve our stores. Uh, we've had uh, Department of Agriculture come in and inspect one of our facilities in Pennsylvania. Uh, that went so well, they invited the CDC to come visit uh, that, that location. Uh, that went really well. They wanted to test whether, you know, our, all the things we were articulating to them were actually PowerPoints or in, in place. Uh, they found that we uh, had those in place and whether they talked to our associates uh, or our leaders. Uh, and maybe one thing just uh, that I think is pretty important, we did have a rapid response team, which I know most others did, but the head of uh, the distribution and transportation uh, group for us is an engineer by background, and they built detailed playbooks for the facilities to execute, whether it was sanitation, cleaning, communication. The tools were very easy for them to pick up and replicate every day. Uh, and I think that was uh, helping us show continuity to uh, not just our associates, but uh, certainly our retail partners as we were on time uh, at remarkably well, considering what, what we were going through in the supply chain. From the product uh, standpoint, uh, we had, uh, you know, demand overnight increased by 100% uh, across the East Coast. Uh, and if you can imagine, uh, which I know many of you have, uh, that kind of uh, demand pull on the supply chain uh, was really tough for the first uh, month. Uh, and we had uh, all of those associates showing up for work, but our product depleted fairly quickly. Uh, you can't, you know, replenish the stores at, when they're selling at 100%, even though we were uh, increasing our output by 35 or 40 percent, we were still slipping behind. Uh, and so when that happened, you could see that move up the supply chain and then our suppliers started having issues. Uh, and we had more than 5,000 items that were either not being produced anymore uh, or being allocated to us. Uh, and so from a year over year standpoint, from POs that we were cutting to our suppliers, uh, you know, we saw somewhere between 500 and 800 percent increase in uh, vendor cuts. Uh, and that was with, uh, obviously, this is a, and Mark mentioned, you know, we're really good at the regional um, impacts and hurricanes and those things. Uh, but when national events happen like this, uh, you know, our supply chain ran out of product and then the suppliers ran out of product in their supply chains and they had to retool uh, and have responded really well. One thing that uh, we did that was uh, somewhat creative uh, not only did we work with the food service industry to take different pack sizes, different cans or vegetables and uh, all of those things to both help our food service 
partners, but to our, our customers. Uh, you know, we have a meat manufacturing facility, and so we were able to take a lot of that product and produce it, uh, break it down for uh, our retail partners. And then in other cases, we sent those directly to store, and they actually uh, cut those up or actually sold large packages. Uh, if you went into our stores, they adjusted pretty quick their planograms and what they are offering. Uh, and we did go through uh, a lot of that product. Uh, Mark mentioned the, the shifting issues, and uh, you know George mentioned this a little bit too. You know, toilet tissue, uh, bath tissue, paper towels, some of these categories you know, spiked more than 100% uh, since the beginning of the event. And you wouldn't know that it still sustains that high because a lot of the stores you go into, you'll see a half aisle full of paper, not a full aisle. And you might not see every brand that you used to see, but we have paper, but the sales are still uh, remarkably high. Uh, and it is uh, funny that you could watch demand spike based on the new cycle. And so we were working with our protein partners uh, and we knew about some shortages that were coming, uh, but we really saw those uh, issues multiply uh, because on CNN for three days in a row, it was the world was ending from a meat supply. Uh, and although we had service issues, we had meat in all of our stores. We had all of the, the different uh, options you could look for, maybe not all the variety you used to or pack sizes. Uh, and so that we've seen that. The other thing that we're seeing uh, that many of the retail uh, organizations in the U.S. are, uh, there's you know things like baking that this time of year are not huge sellers, but everybody's at home cooking. And so this is the time of the year that most of our manufacturing partners build for the fall and winter months, and whether that's soup, baking, or other categories, and those are already under pressure now, and those will be under pressure in the fall uh, and potentially into uh, next year. You know, on the operations side, uh, since March, we've shipped more than 60 million uh, cases uh, above what we had expected to uh, out of our DCs. Uh, we never closed a DC, which I'm pretty proud of. We had uh, our exposure. We have some DCs that have zero uh, positive COVIDs, and we had others that had more than 150. And so we had a range uh, of situations that we had to deal with, uh, but we never had to close a facility. Uh, and we worked really close with our associates on, uh, you know, cleaning, sanitizing, what would make them feel safe? Uh, what did they want for PPE, whether those are masks or gloves? Uh, we never dictated those, but we always supplied them for our associates if they wanted them. Uh, and we mentioned uh, the, the uh, Cisco's of the world and the food service. We also used, because uh, their trucks weren't running. And so we had an opportunity to partner with many of these uh, other uh, companies that were struggling right now to deploy their uh, trucks and drivers to help deliver to our stores. So a lot of that uh, activity happened not only on the people side, the product side, but also on the uh, equipment side. One thing that we did uh, quickly, and we've, we've done this a lot over the last couple of weeks, a couple of months, is we've changed the way that we distribute product to the stores. And items that we used to ship as an each, we shipped as a case. Things that we shipped as a case, we shipped as a tier. Uh, other items, we just pushed pallets out to the stores uh, as fast as we could. As our DC inventory was holding up better than our retail inventory was. Uh, and so retooling uh, basically every week to recalibrate or optimize both the labor and the product available to get it to our, our customers. Uh, and one complexity that a lot of us face, uh, you've got you know regional, uh, local, state uh, folks telling us what they're uh, dictating for terms of operation and whether that's sanitation, curfews and operating and you know navigating all of that was uh, uh, interesting and not always, I would say, logical, truthfully, because we would have uh, in one state uh, different uh, expectations from one county to the next. Uh, and when the counties abut each other, uh, that makes it difficult to, uh, to manage through uh, all of that. Uh, and one last thought, maybe on the fulfillment side, you know, Mark mentioned some of the uh, shifts to online. We've certainly seen uh, a significant shift uh, in testing of that new capability. Uh, we were running somewhere around 30 plus percent uh, same store sales growth in that area. We've doubled that and then some brands tripled that. Uh, we see folks that are uh, adopting that as a new method. I think they found uh, that the ease of it uh, they like. Uh, and I think we've surprised them with the quality of it. And so one deterrent for folks to 
test that in the past has been the quality of things like meat and produce. And I think we've surprised a lot of the customers with uh, what they would experience from a, a product quality and a cost standpoint. Uh, and so I'll go to the next slide. And I'm going to turn it back to George. Hey, thanks, Chris. That was, uh, that was fascinating. And I, I know we probably have a, a billion questions in the, in the audience right now. And I'm just going to look quickly at my Q&A here. And uh, um, here's one for you, Chris. Um, sure. It's from Arubasa. Uh, if, you're, if an alternative supplier runs out of production, how were you able to get product, especially the same brand? This is that's the question uh, that's being yep. asked. So the way that uh, we try to manage our prior procurement hierarchy is we do have primary suppliers that we try to first uh, fulfill demand there. Uh, we have a creative team though that actually was out looking for other product. Uh, and whether that was uh, one example, there's a, a company we partnered with that serves uh, college bookstores. Uh, it's nobody that we had done business with before, but they were selling the same products in college bookstores, but most of the colleges were closed. And so we found north of 500 trucks of uh, paper goods, more than 300 truckloads of uh, hand sanitizer, hand soap, uh, and different items like that. So we, we got creative in other parts or other industries to look for items. Uh, and when that didn't work, we, we shifted more work towards either our private brand supplier uh, or brands, none of, well, none that I've ever heard of. Right. Uh, and probably we won't have again. Uh, but if you go through the paper aisle, for example, you would see items from uh, Chile, uh, different parts of the world that uh, we just never uh, had in our stores before. Yeah, that's, I think that's great, Chris. I think, you know, your examples are, are super good because they just point out the need to be agile, innovative, and resilient. You know, you can't get it the way you used to, so what else can you get? Uh, in fact, sure. that, we have another question from- can I, can I just ask Chris one question, in the context of product supply, Chris, because I think, I don't know that it, this would be an intuitive question for people, but can you talk a little bit about your own brand experience through all of this? Yeah, sure. So we have really good partnerships uh, with some of the uh, biggest private brand manufacturers. Uh, and uh, Juan de Pauli leads our power brand group uh, on the uh, Ajo Dele side. And we, what paid dividends for us is that level of partnership and data sharing. And so we talked to them a lot about demand and production. And I don't think that's necessarily unique. What we were trying to do is extend the window so they would understand what we knew. Uh, and so we saw a lot of our power brand manufacturers step up and go from producing at 100% demand to 130 uh, and then when our partners couldn't go to that next level, uh, they also got creative in finding, you know, packer labels. Uh, because really, if you were looking for hand sanitizer, if I could put it on the floor, uh, people were buying any hand sanitizer they could find. Yeah. And if it was a paper towel, they were going to buy any brand. Uh, and so that's, uh, I think our prior brand suppliers uh, supported us very well through the, the, the issues we've had. Thank you. And uh, in fact, Mark, I have a question for you from Caitlin. Uh, she thanks you for your excellent presentation and she's talking about resilience. Um, uh, so can, she wants to know, can you explain some things you've observed in, with respect to resilient supply chains over the past few months? Resiliency, agility, could you talk about that a little bit? This, sure, this absolutely. Really and then Chris, if you want to bring it to life within your own trading partner relationships, I think the hallmark of our ability to expand the supply chain as needed to be agile to be flexible and frankly we were better at all those things than maybe i thought we would be through all of this but the key to that is trading partner collaboration and open dialogue and communication so we knew if products were going on allocation what the rules of engagement were going to be and manufacturers could look across the country again we've never faced this happening across the entire country at the same time so they may go on allocation in some places and not others. We were trying to, through that communication, be able to shift product supply to where demand was the greatest. Um, we were able to rationalize and um, rationalize assortment and you know change up on a lot of these sort of line extensions to those most in-demand items, those core items within the supply chain and that consumers have come to expect. Um, 
we've learned a lot through this this process. A, you know, what is a reasonable amount of safety stock to have on hand, uh, knowing that, you know, this switch can flip and things can happen very, very quickly. Um, I think this has implications going down the road also that we need to continue to collaborate uh, in those, what I call those blue sky days, when we are in a period of calm, to develop mechanisms to better understand when this is coming, how it's coming, almost like a traffic light system or early warning system that we can use as an industry to expand the supply chain much more quickly than we were able to at this particular point in time. And then the last thing, which is I think maybe just not so much a resilience question, but maybe an open-ended question about what um, inventory is gonna look like going forward. With the contraction within these categories of, of, of uh, that focus on core items, what will assortments look like going forward? What, do, what are the implications for product innovation and new product introductions and line extensions? Some might argue we, you know, this will change the footprint of the store. It will change what you see where and what the consumer experience is going to be going forward. And if we have time, I'll come back to it because I want Chris to weigh in. I'd like to talk maybe a, a little bit about the, what I'll call the food supply chain ecosystem between retail food service and then just feeding people. You know, that, that, those are good points. And I think you, you're, you're raising an issue, which I think is front and center for all of these discussions, which is the customer. And what does the customer want? And, you know, I, I think fundamentally, it seems like the customer behavior has shifted during the COVID-19 crisis. But how much of that will remain? How much of the buying be patterns will remain similar? And I, I guess I'm going to ask uh, Chris, you had a question about how is that going to play out? What you, You've done a great job talking about what you've done. But as you look forward and you think about some of the things that Mark mentioned and other topics around assortment and home versus in the store versus all those, how do you see things being different as you look forward uh, one, two, or three years ahead? Yeah, sure. I think if you go back to uh, one of Mark's slides, he was talking about the, you know, the shift to online and contactless um, frictionless, I think, you know, we're going to see more of a prevalence of a, a desire to have that. And I think that's spot on. And so what we've heard from our, our customers that are picked up our new customers on the, in our online business, uh, they use maybe different words, but this is what they talk a lot about is they, they don't want to have to go into a store. They don't want to have to uh, be the one that touches all the product uh, or assembles a meal. Uh, they want it to be easier for them. And I think we're going to see, uh, you know, a, a greater shift. Mark mentioned the, the number of dollars going that way. Uh, and I think, you know, we do the same thing that Mark mentioned FMI has done is try to re-estimate, okay, what will it be? And every time we update it, it gets bigger and faster. And, you know, COVID seems to have pushed people to that um, space that might not have even thought about it. They might have been aware of a Peapod, which is our e-commerce business. Right. Uh, but this, I think, pushed them into actually trying it, testing it, and after trial, uh, even with higher out of stock, still preferring, hey, that actually is a method I like. Um, and I think that we'll see more of that. And, you know, if you think about the future, there could be new partnerships we'll see. Uh, you talked about restaurants. People still like restaurant food. And, you know, is there some kind of a combination with a grocery store business that combines shopping and, you know, meals? Uh, and uh, there, there could be synergy in uh, the scale of that. And you know, last mile is expensive. So if you can take cost upstream out uh, and deliver a service for a customer, um, I, I, I think we'll see more of that. I, I, can I build on that just a little bit? And I, and I, I actually have another question for Chris as a result. Uh, one is, you, you asked the question, what do, nobody's got a crystal ball. The, people do enjoy dining out. And Pre-COVID-19, roughly 50 cents of every food dollar was being spent away from home. Um, this has changed that dynamic dramatically. Um, the return to restaurants, to, to certain restaurants. I mean, if you look at QSR, quick serve restaurants, they haven't been as dramatically impacted. Limited menu, a lot of drive through and carry out anyway. But when you talk about either casual dining or sit down, white tablecloth dining, those experiences, radical shift. And as we know, you know, the, the forecast is for like 20 to 30% of them to close permanently, which is, is really sad. But a lot of it will depend on consumer confidence and how confident they are being in those establishments and whether that experience will 
uh, be anything like the experience they enjoyed before. That said, a lot of retailers are in the on-premise dining business now as well. Some have actually put up partnerships. So those restaurants that are very popular in localities, HEB down in Texas is actually taking meals and putting them together from local restaurants and making them available to consumers when they come into those stores. Will that, as Chris pointed out, will that lead to a long-term partnership as opposed to the competitiveness that existed between them? Some retailers may go to kiosk on-premise dining and partner with local restaurants and just put them into the stores instead of doing it themselves. Food service operations are very expensive. Labor, food waste, et cetera. A lot of retailers don't have a lot of experience with that and don't have an operator mentality. And that might happen as well. And then the last point, and this will go to my question to you, Chris, which is, you know, we, we frequently say the last mile is the most expensive. And this is what I'm talking about, this massive shift to click and collect and home delivery. Um, we think a lot of retailers are going to be putting up micro fulfillment centers. And that's going to be a change in the supply chain as well. And I wonder, Chris, if you would like to comment on that last point at all. Sure. So um, people at Digital Labs, which uh, part of our company really is our you know, omni uh, channel uh, developer, uh, and they've done a great job of uh, partnering with uh, different micro fulfillment organizations to try to understand the design, how would it work with the supply chain. And to date, we really have a core supply chain and we have a, a, an e-commerce supply chain. And the work that we're trying to do to your point, Mark, is how do you, where in that supply chain do you put automation? And can you put it closer to the customer that takes you know, closer to consumption that really takes more of the cost out downstream. And from a proximity standpoint, you save on the delivery side. And so, you know, transportation is a killer in the last mile standpoint, as well as the, the labor. And I think we will see more and new solution, new solutions uh, to try to drive that cost down closer to the consumption. And I, you know, those, there's a lot of uh, venture capital dollars going out to try to solve that. I think somebody will solve that for us. It's trying to find what that solution is, but also all the way back through the supply chain, we have to take cost out to fund more of that ability. And so whether that's taking capital out of core to try to drive the automation closer to, uh, to where the customers are, I think that's really important for us. And whether that's virtual automation with uh, certain jobs that we can automate or whether it's physical where we can take and build orders uh, whether it's direct to customer orders or uh, you know even the product that goes into these e-commerce centers that takes labor out there i think we'll see more of that and i think it will happen uh, as we were talking about the advancement uh, things you know seem like they're far out and because of covid i think it's going to be a heightened um point for all of us to try to solve and so i think that we will we will see that and i think we'll see it in our company too and Chris, Chris, let me ask you another question about that. You know, as you struggled through this whole crisis, uh, some of your suppliers must have been in challenging times as well. Did you find it necessary to, um, I don't know, place advance orders with your suppliers to keep them going as you went through some dry spells? Or, or is the food chain, the supply chain in your business so strong that you didn't have that issue? Uh, no, I think there was opportunistic times when you shopped our stores that I think the way my wife would describe it is, is like Christmas. I know I'm going to get meat. I just don't know if I'm getting poultry today or I'm getting beef. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, part of it was if you go up the supply chain, manufacturing got hit hard with COVID. If you think about the proximity of how they do their work, um, we saw lots of closures in that space. And some of those were a day some were a week, some closed for two weeks. And if you think about, just to pick on poultry, if you're in the poultry side of the industry and you had multiple sites down, uh, your flow of products to all the retailers at a time when the demand is higher than ever, uh, it's, you know, you feel it really quick and it's hard to catch up. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're starting to see is more stability in the manufacturing side. And we did work with them and they have like lowered the number of items they're producing to increase the demand on fewer items. And so what we'll probably see in the fall, we may not go back to the same level of variety we had. Um, we'll increase what we have today. Uh, and I think that will help the manufacturers catch up. Uh, yep. And so we'll see some of that. And you know, the first week when this really hit us hard, 
we bought out two extra weeks in all of our DCs, uh, but we only probably got 60% of it because the manufacturers didn't have the product. And so we, 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 re we react on a daily basis based on what we see for a retail physician, uh, our customer traffic, um, but going upstream, there's still a lot of challenges. They're catching up, but there's still a lot of challenges. You know, I might add, George, that Ajo Delhaize is in a better position than many with suppliers, just given their size and scale. So you talk mm -hmm. about scale and um, their ability to source and, and um, get what they need from their manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And even they were limited. And the other thing is within those protein categories, they don't travel well. So, you know, if you have slowdowns or shutdowns in center store categories, you can ship from one plant to the other. Your cost basis may go up, but it's doable. You can't move cattle around the country if one plant closes from the East Coast to the West Coast or vice versa. It's just not happening. So that added to that. But I do want to say, and I think it's important because I know we don't have a lot of time, but there is, a, there is another message in all this. And that is, there were lots of questions around, are we going to run out of food? Is there enough product in the food supply? And the answer to that is, no, we're not going to run out of food. And there was always product. And I said there are you know, three components, three supply chains within the food ecosystem. There's the retail supply chain, there's the food service supply chain, and then there's the feeding supply chain. And that's an important component as well. When you have 40 million unemployed, you've already been feeding a lot of people who are at risk or have the need. And it was never for, and you saw the pictures of farmers plowing under crops and the spilt milk. And by the way, it's more devastating to them than anyone else. That's their livelihood. And they work the land. It's really important to understand that. There were not shortages. What we had challenges with was moving product point to point. And we are in the process, one of the lessons learned of setting up what I'll call the new food deal, like the new deal of the FDR era, which is better understanding the connectivity between those what were disparate and parallel supply chains to figure out how we have a more integrated supply chain, regardless of what, where and how you procure or you're being fed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Here's a question we have that I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to this question. It's a really good question. It's, it's from one of our colleagues in Africa. And uh, um, they're asking about uh, maybe to comment on how these things are playing out in the African continent. I, I don't have good visibility. And we do a lot of work in Africa, but not in the food business. What, do, do either of you or both of you know about uh, the situation in Africa and how things are being handled there? Uh, Chris, I'll, do you have a perspective, Chris? No, I don't. I don't have a, a large perspective. We have members who operate there and we've, we've had several, what I'll call international um, uh, sharing sessions with our board. Uh, and we, and we, and so we share perspectives from Asia, Europe, Africa, Latin America, UK, U.S. And obviously, just by the way, just so everybody knows, I'm sure you do, but Chris's Ajo Belhaze USA is a division of Ajo Belhaze, the European-based company. So they do have far-flung operations, maybe not so much in Africa. Um, but in Southern Africa, one of our members, Tobias Wasmut of SPAR, operates in, in South Africa. And so in South Africa, the country, Zimbabwe, neighboring um, areas, they handled things differently. There were much more restrictions on what consumers could buy. Um, and again, this is probably a month old, so this could be stale by now on the basis of, you know, the ever shifting sands of COVID-19 and its impact. There were some concerns about needing to contain significantly because the infrastructure is not quite as mature as it is here, the hospital system, the lack of ventilators, et cetera. So I can't comment too much more on supply per se, um, but we can get, if, George, if, if your colleague in, in Africa would like more information, we can get answers to those questions with a much greater degree of specificity. I wonder whether we've lost George. We may have I'm, lost I'm, here. I'm here. I just, I don't know, it's a, a sunspot <laughs> or something. I don't know what happened. Um, <laughs> but I, Mark, I'm sure you had a great answer to that question. I didn't hear all of it, but. <laughs> but I have another. I have another question. We have a, we have a person on the phone. I just noticed uh, on Zoom with us, who's a professor at Cornell, uh, uh, Vishal Guar. Uh, do you have a comment? I want to, Mark. You made a point about uh, food waste and about in the supply chain. You know, dumping milk and so forth. Um, maybe, uh, Professor, you could comment a little bit on, on your observations about what's happening in in that area. I know you've done some good work in in the in the supply chain space. 
Thank you, George. And uh, thanks, uh, Mark and Chris as well. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to hear about all of the things and especially the supply chain resilience that uh, we are seeing um, when there was a lot of anxiety earlier about uh, shortages, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, I do work in, uh, in food waste. And uh, the, the interesting thing here is that many of the things that you're doing now to increase cross supply chain collaboration or bring in ideas like the food industry exchange uh, or improve communication in the entire supply chain are going to be helpful in reducing food waste also, I think. Um, because what we have discovered in our research is that food waste is not a problem that can be solved only by the retailer or only by the manufacturer. Uh, it's a problem that requires collaboration across the entire supply chain. Um, we used uh, data from, uh, from retailers and from CPG manufacturers to study this problem and found that you know, product can get wasted because of decisions that were taken anywhere in the entire supply chain. And so having, having coordination across the players is really helpful. Um, and the interesting thing is that all of these players share the same goal. They all want to reduce food waste. They are working at it independently. And then when they collaborate with each other, it gets so much better. So I think the things you're doing about uh, using technology and improving collaboration are going to be helpful. The, uh, the waste we used to see earlier was more because of expiration or at the consumer. The waste we are seeing now is a little bit different because of the, the challenges in movement as you described. So um, those are things that we'll have to be very thoughtful about. Thank you, Professor Gower. And you're right, it used to be, you know, there's still some food waste that occurs in the household. In food service, it's a little different. A lot of it is at the plate, at the table. Um, and you might know, and if, if you don't, I'd be happy to put you in touch. We are one of three founding members of the Food Waste Reduction Alliance, where we work upstream with manufacturers and across over with the restaurant operators, with the National Restaurant Association. And we're expanding our partnerships there as well, and would love to include you in that discussion, given the good work that you've been doing. Thank you very much. This is, believe it or not, the hour is uh, almost done. We're, we're just about finished. I just want to say a couple of things to wrap up. First of all, I want to thank our, our two panelists who are just fabulous. Mark and Chris, you did a great job uh, laying out the issues and some solutions and where things are going. We have a bunch of other questions that were not quite answered, and I'll work to make sure that all of you get some answers back. And uh, you can always visit our website. Uh, digital supply chain institute.org to uh, uh, see the data here and get copies of the presentation. We'll make sure that all of you get that uh, so that you'll have, you'll have that. And we'll have the ability to talk with you uh, again if, uh, if you'd like uh, about these same, very same topics. Uh, one thing I'll just note for you is that we just completed a big in-country uh, survey of India, and then we did a second report. We just published it uh, yesterday about Germany. So as we go around the world, we pick different markets that are important and we focus in on supply chain issues that are being uh, at least prompted by the COVID-19 crisis. So please go ahead and look at dcinstitute.org if you want to find out about Germany or India or some or other reports, as well as a bunch of other research. Um, and of course, um, you know, there's a lot of other information out there that uh, I'm sure you have that we can share and talk through again as we, as we go forward. But Thanks everyone for coming, especially a great thanks to our, uh, our panelists. And uh, we're gonna have another one of these collaboratories in just a few weeks. I'll, uh, I'll let you know the date and I'll invite everyone to it as well. It will not be on the food industry, but it'll be on industries that have some of the very same topics in common. So uh, thank you all for coming and we look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Chris. Yep. Thank thanks, Chris. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you all.